Welcome to Midweek Talks, where we help you follow Jesus and answer your questions in the middle of personal, cultural, social, family issues, particularly in the nation that we're living in right now. I'm Mark Ivey, your host today. Make sure that you share this and subscribe on YouTube and other platforms that we are on, Apple Podcast, Facebook, Spotify, and YouTube, uh, and make sure that somebody knows about Midweek Talks. This week, I want to just take a few moments and go back a few months and then help us evaluate where we are and then see what the future might look like when the whole COVID event took place. For many of us, whether it was in the business world or in the church world, it sort of upended things. It really wasn't expected, at least it wasn't expected that businesses would shut down or churches would shut down. And so we had to make some really quick adjustments. I want to give a shout out to all of our tech team here and all those people that work so really hard. As we found out, I think here, like on a Friday, we were not going to be able to do church that following weekend and we're not doing church, live services at least, for about three months. And our tech team and those individuals and our staff just did a, an amazing job about pulling things together, uh, getting things recorded, produced, and I just want them to know how much I appreciate them. And what you watched online was a result of some really, really hard work, late nights, early mornings of individuals making things happen. So I want to go back and just sort of help us reset where we're at because what the COVID event did was really set or reset a number of things and that's not all bad. Some people can point to all of the, the challenging things that have happened but one of the things that has taken place is that businesses, corporations, families and churches have stepped back and reevaluated, hopefully they've reevaluated, what is important, what is not as important, and asking themselves those questions. So when you're making decisions behind the scenes, like for instance, there were individuals that were saying to us, you know, we got to get back to church, we got to get back to church. What they didn't know was what our insurance company was telling us uh, about our liabilities in things if we didn't do things a certain way. So we had to say, well, okay, we're going to have to wait. And then there are other individuals that said, well, it's too soon. So at some point, you have to make decisions and move forward with those decisions about whatever those decisions happen to be. And you have to stick with those decisions. It is a real opportunity to reevaluate right now. I think that this is a time for 90 degree turns. And what do I mean by that? I mean that if you were wanting to sort of rearrange the deck chairs on the ship of your business or your church, uh, that might have looked nice, but the deep changes that you really needed to make and the things that were challenging to make, you have an opportunity to do it right now. And when I say 90 degree changes, I usually say, that 90 degree changes are not the best things to do. We're, we're headed this way and then we suddenly go this way. I want to suggest to you right now that this is an opportune time for you to be able to make some significant shifts personally. And we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about business shifts. We'll talk about church shifts because right now businesses are reevaluating, families are reevaluating. Churches are reevaluating. What makes sense? And the real question is are we fulfilling our mission or are we just wanting to get back to normal? I think that's the real question because if we're just wanting to go back to the way things were, potentially we're going to miss the real opportunity that is before us and ultimately what we believe God is trying to do with us in businesses and ultimately in his church. I know that sometimes it's easy for us to settle back in, but I'm not sure that that is the best thing for us to do. 
because if we're just going to settle back in, I remember listening to um, uh, an economic uh, program. It was actually the news. We were talking about economics, and they were doing all of these projections about what the economy was going to do in America. And they said, we keep missing our projections. And this was the statement. It's because we don't have a model for this. And I want to challenge you that if you go back to old models, we may miss the projection. If we go back to just the way things were, and if we lean on what worked before, we may miss the opportunities that are before us. So I just want to talk about a few things today as we're going to spend some time together and see if maybe it isn't time to think about some new models, but also time to say, hey, do I want to just settle back into the way things were so that I can feel familiar again? Or is there something bigger that needs to happen in my life? And what we really need to do as individuals, as businesses, and as churches, is to not just think local, because we really uh, get our perspective. It's very small sometimes. It's our neighborhood. It's our workplace. It's our local church. But we don't just need to think local. We need to think national. But we don't just need to think national. We need to think global and see what is taking place around the world and then is there anything, and if you are a believer in Christ, regardless of your occupation, is there anything that God might be saying in the middle of all of this? Many of you are familiar with George Barna and the Barna organization that has helped many individuals with the statistics, the evaluations, the surveys that they consistently do to give us a feel, to give us a sense where people are at. And as part of this COVID event, the Barna organization has done something called the State of the Church. And I just want to share some of this with you because it is interesting because it does give us a perspective about where things are at. So according to their surveys at the start of the summer, and, and what we knew was this, is that up until Easter, online viewing, for instance, for churches, uh, was pretty steady, pretty strong. After Easter, it significantly dropped off. And at the start of the summer, according to Barna, half of all churched adults, so those are individuals that would say they go to church maybe once or twice a month. I'm, I'm sort of a regular churchgoer. Listen to this. Half of all church adults have not streamed a church service in the past four weeks. The majority of pastors, 96% of pastors, report their churches have been streaming their worship services. But that may not matter for about half of church adults because those that say they had attended prior to that, about half of them say they've not streamed an online service in the last month. And even looking at a more consistent segment, practice, practicing Christians who are typically characterized by at least monthly attendance, one in three admit they have not streamed an online service during this time. Now, what are the implications of that and why is that? Well, first of all, we know that about 15% of those individuals that are streaming services are multitasking. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Well, they have the church service on, but they're doing other things around the house. Well, of course, the engagement level is less doing that. And as wonderful as online ministry is, there's still a different atmosphere when you're in the building with a group of people. And so you have people multitasking. You have about half now that are not watching at all. And here's what has happened. As churches have come back into their buildings in various locations across the country. Some are not back in yet. As churches have done that, obviously their attendance now is running somewhere between 30 and 50%, depending on how long they've been back in the building. And so the question is, why are we at those numbers? Why are we not higher than that? And there's a couple of things to think about. Why people have stopped watching online and then why people have not come back into the building. The first thing 
to consider is that it takes about 21 days to form a habit. So if after a 21 day period I have consistently done something or not done something, it tends to fall in a pattern of what I will do in the future. So many churches, and some of them are still out and some of them will be out through the end of the year, they're out for months. And so new habits have been developed. New patterns have been developed. And when you take a look at the COVID event itself, it does appear, secondly, that people are still a little uh, concerned about being in a group of people. And that's certainly understandable. I did read a statistic, though, the other day that said um, churches were not, and the first statistics we got out contradicted this, but the newest uh, information we get said churches were not um, a high place of transmission versus like a bar or something like that. Uh, and that should be an encouragement uh, to people as they decide to come back to their churches. Here's something else that we've also seen is that COVID in the workplace and in the church place, quite frankly, has been used as an excuse either not to come to work or not to go to church. And so there were blanket statements by corporations. Listen, if you don't feel comfortable coming to work, you don't have to. We'll give you this amount of time paid off. And of course, people said, hey, that's good. I'll take the time off. They weren't really concerned about COVID. I also know that there are individuals that have used COVID as an excuse. Well, we're just, you know, we're really concerned about COVID right now, so we're not coming back into the church building, when in reality, it may be more of a developmental habit that has taken place uh, than a real concern about uh, getting something uh, from a virus. We also know that just three in 10 churchgoers have had contact with a church leader in the last month. Okay, so why does that matter? Okay, well, in a time of social distancing and isolation, and by the way, um, the, the term social distancing is really an oxymoron because you can't really be social at a distance, per se. But this may surprise some people. Social distancing is actually a biblical concept. If you go back into the Old Testament and the New Testament, first century uh, Jewish culture, Social distancing was something that God asked people to do if somebody was sick. So that if you had a sore that was open, if you were bleeding, if you had leprosy or something like that, then you were required to stay apart from the rest of the group. But what's interesting of what social distancing has done today in that day, and actually biblically, it was not required for everybody. Social distancing was only required for those individuals who were sick. It was not required for those who were healthy. Now, what we've done across the country is we've required it for everybody. I, I'm not talking about the positives or negatives of that. I'm just telling you what the biblical concept was. There was social distancing in the Bible, but it was only for those who were sick. So in a time of social distancing and isolation, here's what we found out. The unintended consequences of this is that it's impacting the relational, emotional, and mental health of people. And because people don't have contact with whether it's individuals on their job or particularly their social uh, spheres, whether they're in uh, neighborhoods or in a church, what we're finding out is that that lack of social contact, particularly among those that are in church, has led to more emotional and physical and spiritual challenges. And it's really, as you look across the statistics across America, the mental health of individuals has been significantly affected. And we also know this, that individuals during this pandemic have not really made a church switch. It's more likely for those that call themselves Christians, to have stopped attending church altogether, completely. And we also know that one half, 50% of millennials, that would be the age group of those that are 22 to around 38 years of age. They're, they're, they're younger, but they probably may have a, a child or two or three kids. That half of 
Christian millennials are not, not only going to church, they're not even view, viewing services online. So there has been a significant disconnect from spiritual things, which, interestingly enough, an unintended consequence, has had an emotional and physical result. And that's why we're seeing that those who are no longer attending church are bearing emotional burdens that they were not having to bear before, even though there may have been the similar things that were going on. They're bearing it by themselves. Now, even in a church service, people may have a casual conversation with a person seated beside them or somebody they know or one of the pastors at that particular church. That's not happening now. And so what we understand is that those no longer attending church are bearing the emotional burdens. And here's what we have seen is that during this COVID event that we have watched people fall off from the rails emotionally, financially, spiritually, and morally. And we know from our own city there is an uptick in the calls to law enforcement about domestic challenges in the home. Now, that's not COVID's fault, okay? That may suggest more about where we are at personally and how we manage these things. And really, quite frankly, it may have something to say about how healthy or not healthy our churches were prior to this event. Because if you go back to the first century, and as you look throughout history, there have been many believers who have been placed in very difficult and lonely situations. One of them comes to mind, the Apostle John. He is, he is on the island of Patmos. That was a, a prisoner colony. And he is in isolation. He is in tribulation. And then he moves to the place of revelation. He's all by himself. But the Bible specifically says that by himself, he was in the spirit in the Lord's day. And so our challenge is how do we maneuver a relationship with God when nobody else is around? It is certainly possible. But if the spiritual disciplines of prayer, of the word of God, and even a connection through a phone call or a text message or something are missing, then we really find that maybe we were not as healthy as we thought we were. And so you have all of this taking place. And then I don't just want to talk about the practical side, but what about the prophetic side of this? What is God saying? And, and what are some things that we need to be aware of? Okay, let me walk through some of those things with you. Here's the first thing. There is a sense, as I mentioned, of wanting to fall back into normalcy again in the church world. And I want, you, I want to be honest and tell you that that could be one of the most dangerous things that we could ever do. So if we have what we call a biblical worldview, what is a biblical world, worldview? It is when we run all of our decisions, all of our thoughts, all of the actions that we're going to take, not through our feelings because we're living in a very feeling-oriented culture. So if I feel like doing it, it's okay. Or if I don't feel like doing it, it's not okay. Whatever I feel like doing is what I'm going to do. A biblical worldview allows me to run all of my decision-making through the Scripture. That's what a biblical worldview is. And a number of years ago, some of you may have read this book. It was written by the Barna organization, George Barna. It was called Think Like Jesus. And they asked all of the standard questions across American evangelicals and to determine who really has a biblical worldview, okay? Not just their own worldview, not just their friend's worldview, their family's worldview, but God's worldview. So they asked all of these standard questions of how Christians should possibly think to have a biblical worldview. And this was the result. What do you think the percentage was of Christians in America who, who actually have a biblical worldview. Any guesses? 
it was 9%. Now, I want you to think about the implications of that. So, out of 100 people, only nine of those individuals really had a biblical worldview and were able to run their decision-making through God's point of view. This is important because there's a lot of noise, whether it's noise in the media, noise of friends, noise of family, noise in our own heads, that's coming to us right now. And we're getting a lot of opinions from multiple sources. There's no lack of opinions from the media to social media and other sources, print media. There's no lack of opinion. The challenge is, is that if we are going to function in the future with a fresh understanding of what is, it is to live with a biblical world view that God actually created every nation, every people group, loves all nation, then this corona event is actually the 9-11 for the church of Jesus Christ. It's not just let it pass, but shift things and not go back to normal. Now, I don't know how, how many of you were alive when 9-11 happened. It was 2001. We had just started this church here. 9-11 happened in September. We had started the church uh, in the spring. And the church was not very large at the time. And we were meeting in a band room at a local middle school. But here's what I remember about the Sunday following 9-11. It was a full house. As many people at that time who were connected with us at that time, and it wasn't a large group, but those individuals who were connected with us said, you know what, we better go to church this Sunday. Understand with me that that persisted for a few weeks, and then church attendance went back to normal as everybody sort of fell back into the normal pattern. Here's what we don't want to miss. This corona event is just not affecting a city in America. It's not just affecting America. It is affecting cities and nations, every nation around the world. That might mean that maybe God is trying to say something to us. This is the 9-11 event, but we cannot fall back into old patterns, things that we've done maybe shouldn't be done the same way. Jesus talked about putting new wine into old wineskins. Now, what was that? Well, a wineskin was a container for liquid, and it was where grape juice was stored. Well, as that grape juice would ferment, it would expand the wineskin or the animal skin, as it were. And so as the skin would expand, if it was a new skin, and not old and brittle, that skin would expand with the fermentation of the grapes. But if you put grapes into an old wineskin, and those grapes begin to expand as the fermentation process would take place, that old wineskin that was old, hard, it would crack, and the wine, the grape juice that's expanding, that's fermenting, that's inside of the wineskin would just leak out. And this is why Jesus says, you cannot put new wine into old wineskins. And if he's saying anything to us today, it is to wake up and move out of our old traditional patterns. That just, just doesn't mean in the church. Businesses have to ask themselves questions. Okay, how can we be more efficient here? What potential is there of waste if we don't fix this area of our distribution or this area of our customer service or this area of our promotion or our advertising. There's a story in the Bible. It is the familiar story of Jesus going in and cleansing the temple. And it, he really didn't cleanse it as much as he reformed it. So if you're not familiar with the story, remember it's Passover season. There could be upwards of one million additional people in the city of Jerusalem 
to celebrate the Passover. It was a yearly celebration. And people from far away would either bring their animals with them. If they couldn't bring their animal, they had to purchase an animal uh, in the surrounding area of the temple. Well, when you went to buy the animal, the first thing you had to do was exchange your money for temple money because there was no standard currency at the time in the Roman Empire. So the money changers, rather than exchanging it at the current rate of exchange, they made people and really cheated people at higher rates of interest to get more money out of those individuals. Then, if you'd happen to bring an animal, the priest would say, well, that animal's not clean enough or not perfect enough. Then you'd have to go and buy another animal that upped your cost. And the interesting thing about this is that when Jesus does this, he says, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. Where all of this was taking place was in the court of the Gentiles. Now, the court of the Gentiles was the outermost court of the temple area. It was the only place where the nations could come and learn about God and pray to God and seek God. But now this place had been taken over by individuals who were there really to cheat the people and push the nations out. And so Jesus goes in there. And this had been a practice for many, many years. He will do it at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry, the week before he's crucified. He goes in there and he upsets the tables. He drives out the animals. And this was such a shocking thing for Jesus to do. Because what person is going to go in and upset the tradition of the temple? What person is going to go in and challenge the priests of how they've been doing things all of these years? What individual who calls himself a rabbi is going to suggest that what they are doing is violating the commandments of God? Who is going to do that? What individual is going to say that this is a money-making scheme? This has nothing to do with God. Well, Jesus did that. Now listen, this is what the Lord is trying to do right now in our personal lives and in the American church. He is trying to upset the formality and the control and the tradition that we think is God, but we've made it very comfortable for us. And we've made it uncomfortable for people who don't have a relationship with God. We've made it uncomfortable for the outsider but made it very comfortable for the insider. We create our church services, our worship services for the comfort level of the people that are here. And Jesus goes into the temple and he says, this isn't about your comfort level and your tradition. This is about my father's house being a house of prayer. So, there is a real sense of wanting to fall back into normalcy again in the church world. I'm challenging you to back away from that and say, wait a minute, what needs to shift in my life? What needs to shift in my perspectives? What needs to change? When I come to church, am I there to get or am I there to give? Are those people there? It's, it's, you know, church anymore is a very non-participatory activity. You come, we come, sit, listen, go home. Come, sit, listen, go home. We'll let other people do the ministry. That's not my responsibility. Well, this is the thing that Jesus is trying to shake up. And he doesn't want us going back to normal. Let me say it again. The corona event is the 9-11 event of the church. And God is wanting to bring an earthquake through the church, through the body of Christ. If you go back to old models, if we go back to the way things always were and just fit back in to what worked, what the plan was, what we are able to do, what feels comfortable, we could potentially miss 
the opportunities ahead of us because what needs to happen, there may be no model for it. We'll create the model. Not in a board meeting, but in a prayer meeting. As we ask God to help us and say, God, what do you want to do? I would challenge those of you that are in business to say, okay, what do we need to do in our business so we don't settle back into the norm because you may lose customers by going back into the norm. Your customer base may be changing. Your customer base may be less. You lose customers. Sit back and say, okay, what do I need to do in my business? My father was a successful businessman. And I remember growing up in this business, it was the hospitality business. It was hotels, restaurant, lounges. And he was very successful in it. I heard a story about my dad, and I didn't know this until after he had passed away. If you went and stayed at Ivy's back then motel or then Ivy's motor lodge, it was the cleanest hotel that you would ever stay in. So when housekeeping would take clean the rooms, my father would go back in behind housekeeping and make sure every room had been cleaned specifically to his satisfaction. Nothing was left to chance. I didn't know this, but when they cleaned the toilets, they would take a toothbrush. Now you say, this is, this is terrible. Nobody should, be able, should have to do that. Listen, they took a toothbrush, would clean underneath the rims of toilets. Well, who cleans that? I'm telling you, you stayed at this hotel, my dad's hotel, it was clean. And I watched my father in a time of challenge because in, back in 1980, if you remember, the interest rates were like about 18 and 20% right before Reagan uh, was elected president. And I watched him work through all of, this, all, all of these challenging times. And he and my mom keep a level of excellence and be able to make changes, be able to build, be able to make the transitions that were necessary in terms of what the public was wanting in terms of, of business. Uh, and then when he, he built another hotel up along the interstate and highly modern, highly clean. I just cannot emphasize to you the cleanliness of that hotel. And I've stayed in a lot of hotels in my life and my wife and I, 15 years on the road, we've stayed in a lot of places. Sometimes we end up cleaning the hotel room, unfortunately. What I'm challenging you to do is not just to think yesterday, but to think tomorrow. Think that way in your personal life. Think that way in your family. Think that way in your business. And think that way in your church. Because the old models that we have may not work. And we don't want to fall back into normalcy. I can't say this again enough. And as my role as a, as a, a leader here in this church, I'm saying to our folks regularly, we cannot fall back into old patterns. Now, what does it necessarily look like? I don't know that I can define that in the sense, because I don't know what your specific context of life or business or ministry is. I will say this, that in order to, to really know the future, you have to ask God to give you some insight, some wisdom. I mean, one of the best leadership principles that I've ever learned is to approach leadership from the position of weakness and not the position of strength. Because if you will approach leadership from the position of weakness, then you will come to the place where you start to understand that you don't have all the answers. And God really does have some answers. And so in order to move forward, sometimes we have to sit back and say, okay, what is it that I need to do? What needs to shift? What needs to change? And I don't want to belabor the point but I want to say to those of you uh, around this nation and those of you that attend this church, old patterns are old wineskins. 
And if we're going to be able to contain something that is new, the wineskin or the mindset, the habits, the thinking has to change. Here's something else I want you to think about. As individuals, organizations, businesses, and churches, we have an opportunity to connect with the emotional, spiritual, and practical needs of people like never before. I think some of you have heard me share this before. When the corona event began, I said, okay, what do I need to do in my neighborhood? So I went around to each mailbox. I printed up this little thing, gave our address and our phone number. And I said, look, if you need this, if you need toilet paper, if you need whatever, just let us know. And I'm doing this around midnight at night, okay? And I'm driving through my neighborhood, and I notice a light come on in one of the porches. So, so I come back around, I go around, take a left, go all the way down, come back around the cul-de-sac, come up, take another left, go down the cul-de-sac, then come back the opposite side of the road. There is a guy standing on his porch with a shotgun because I didn't realize how on edge all of this was making people feel. And there may be smiles with your neighbors. There may be smiles in your family, your friends, your church people. But I just want you to know that there's a different level of emotional and spiritual sensitivity that is really giving us an opportunity right now. I want to challenge you with that opportunity. I want to challenge you. In a few days, we'll start 21 days of acts of kindness here. And every day, we're going to try and do an act of kindness for someone, somewhere, something. I want to challenge you not to be all about yourself because people really do need what you have to offer. And right now, right now in our culture, we have the perfect opportunity to be able to move into areas of people's hearts and their emotions and their families that maybe were not open before. Take the opportunity. Don't miss the opportunity. Those of you that, have, that, are, that are in leadership positions, whatever your organization is, whether it's a business, a church, find ways that you can help the neighborhood around you. Find ways that you can help the city that is around you. That's only to your benefit and the benefit of people that you come in contact with. Here's something else I want you to think about. We know that when corona started, for businesses and particularly churches, people were not gathering as frequently and for churches they weren't gathering at all. I want to challenge you not to think sanctuary. I want to challenge you to think city. And then don't just think city, think nation. And then don't just think nation, think world. Well, how do I do that? I'm, I'm in the back end of East Overshoe here, up in the mountains, or I'm in a, a smaller community um, that nobody really pays attention to, and there's all of these larger things around me. Listen, I want to challenge you Rather than spend money on things that will just make you more comfortable, why not thinking about spending money? If you're going to make an investment, spend money on your online presence. Spend money on cameras. Spend money on production. You say, well, we don't have a lot of production. There's organizations that will do it for you. Well, we don't really know how to do it. There are people that will help you do it. There is really a difference, and, and I'm grateful for anybody that tried to do anything online when this started, but there is a difference in terms of the watchability of someone that has something nicely produced versus somebody with an old camera with terrible audio and sound and picture, who are we going to want to watch? Now, here's the reality of it. Individuals and churches are watching nationally produced programs every day of their life. They're listening to nationally produced programs that, that are really done well. My question is, why should the church 
do any less. So when you're thinking about budgeting as 2021 comes around, because our online presence does not need to go away. As a matter of fact, monetizing the online presence should be something that every business and every organization is thinking about. So if, if you're over here in a restaurant, how do you get online to sell food outside of the doors of your restaurant? How do you get online to sell tires? How do you get online to do something else beyond the physical location? Because it's not about building more buildings, it's about attracting more people or getting more people involved in the process. How do you do that? And specifically for churches, I just want you to think that what you do online and how it looks matters. And when you're thinking about budgeting, that can't be at the bottom of your list. It has to be upwards in the list somewhere so that you say, you know what? This really matters. This is important. What we're doing inside of the four walls is one thing, but what we do outside of the four walls is another. And the only way you're going to get that out there is with a significant online presence that is done well. Here's one more thing to consider, and it's a financial consideration. As we take a look across the country, there are organizations that are doing well financially. There are organizations that are not. Much of that has depended upon whether or not businesses, certain businesses have been allowed to open or if, they're, if they have to stay closed. When you think about 2021 and 22, take into consideration your budgeting priorities in terms of what you think is not going to make, and I'm talking just to churches for the moment, is not what is going to make the people in the house comfortable, but what is going to be able to help the people outside of the house, what monies need to be spent. Take a look at your percentages. Take a look at the track of your giving, those of you that are leading churches. Take a look and see, okay, what do we think is going to take place over the next number of months? Now, you can, you can take a look. We've, we've got a pretty good track record now because we're into the fall of the year and you're going to be able to see whether your giving was off, whether it increased. Um, we had an increase in giving here um, over, the, over 2020, which we're grateful for. But that may not be the case in every organization, and it might not be the case in the future. We anticipate that it will be. But if we only try to draw from the one well, then we're going to limit ourselves financially. So I want to challenge you with something in this financial consideration. What can you do that can produce income beyond the tithe and the offering? Can you rent out a space? Can you purchase a food truck? Can you do something that would potentially produce income just beyond the tithe and the offering? Can you purchase a piece of real estate? Can you buy a building and rent it? Can you do something? We have to think more beyond just Sunday morning church, folks. We have to think about what it is to make an investment in the city. Where can you give beyond the four walls? Because one of the three disciplines that Jesus taught us was prayer, giving, and fasting was a spiritual discipline that privately done would bring public results. Just think about that. Broaden your mind a little bit. Get around people who are thinkers. Get around people who can, can, are not no people. Get around people who are possibility people. Well, we can't do that for this reason. We can't do that for that reason. Listen, every one of us have been given a mind of creativity by God. And the things that God puts in our minds, we think sometimes, well, it's not possible. If God put it in our minds, then there is a way for it to happen. I want to challenge those of you that are in the workplace Pursue what is in your heart. It was put there by God. Those of you that are in businesses, in the expansion of your business, and the things that are in your heart, take some risk and see what you can do to expand for the purposes of the kingdom growth. It's not just for personal purposes. What can a church do to be able to make investments in a community? What lines of business can be 
accomplished through a church for the purpose of kingdom purposes. Remember that there were four water sources that went into the Garden of Eden, not just one. And God wants you to have multiple streams of income. God wants you to have multiple ways that you can invest in the kingdom. That's the whole purpose of it, investing in the kingdom of God. So we have been given an opportunity with this whole COVID event. And, and regardless of what you believe about it, set that aside. We have been given an opportunity to rethink, to restructure, to make 90 degree turns and maybe do things that we never thought were possible before. I want to challenge you to begin thinking that way and not to look at this COVID event as something terrible. In many ways, and, and there are people, yes, there are people that have lost their lives. And maybe some of you watching have lost a family member or a friend. That's awful. It's terrible. What, however, does God want to say to us in the middle of this and in the middle of challenge, what opportunities are there that could be right in front of us to help people, to strengthen people, to increase business opportunity, church opportunity? I want to challenge you with all of this. And let's begin to reset ourselves. I know sometimes that we develop new habits. Some of those old habits were good. We don't want to throw it all out. Some of those old habits of going to people's homes and attending church, making sure we're not missing the stream of what God is saying. Some of those things are really, really important. And the things that we need to cut off, let's let go of them. The things we need to hold on to, let's hold on to them. But let's take a look at what has happened over the last number of months. And regardless of what happens in the next few weeks or months, regardless of what happens politically in this nation, God always presents to us an open door of opportunity if we will look at it and see it clearly. Let me encourage you with that today. Thanks for being with us on Midweek Talks. Make sure you share this, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and we will see you next time.